I think that the multifamily sector has significant political headwinds, but very, very robust demand. Um, and we've seen the land market um, picking up in areas where we have uh, good dynamics, where the condo market seems to be doing pretty well. So that market is good. The land market for rental land is non-existent because there's no tax abatement today. Hotel land is starting to pick up because the hotel sector is doing relatively well out of 120,000 hotel rooms, 30,000 are no longer hotel rooms. Let's get ready to scale. Hey guys, welcome to yet another episode of Ready to Scale. I'm your host, Jeanette Friedrich, Director of Investor Relations at Blue Lake Capital. Before we jump into today's show, don't forget to like and subscribe to the show. Uh, we have been growing at a solid clip and we're excited to hit some goals for the end of the year. So we definitely would appreciate you liking and subscribing. Now let's get to the fun part. So joining me once again is the one and only New York's Bob Knackle. If you're not familiar with Bob, Bob is a sales broker selling investment properties in New York City since 1984. From 1988 through 2014, Bob closed over 6,000 transactions with an aggregate value in excess of $23 billion. To date, Bob has personally been responsible for the sale of over 2,000 buildings, generally considered to be the highest total ever for a single broker in New York, and this is at the tune of $21 billion in sales. He previously served as the chairman of New York Investment Cells and head of New York Capital Market Group for JLL. He has a, a BS in economics, finance, and entrepreneurial management from Wharton, and he's coming to us from, of course, New York City. Bob, welcome back to the show. Jeanette, great to be with you today. And just one clarification, the, the, the 6,000 transactions was uh, the total number of deals that uh, my old company, Massey Knackle, sold. Um, and that was a business that Paul Massey and I ran for 26 years and 46 days before we sold it to Cushman and Wakefield in 2014. But 6,000 was, uh, was for the entire company. Uh, personally, I'm, I'm as of last week standing at 2,330 and, uh, going strong, but, uh, all is well. And, uh, it's always so great to see you, Jeanette. Yeah, likewise. Well, and I appreciate you sharing the credit. That's a good team attitude and a good team spirit right there, Bob. All right. So, Bob, I'm very excited to have you on. Um, there's so much going on in the media about commercial real estate. I mean, it sounds like doom and gloom. The sky is falling. You know, what is your opinion? And especially given the fact that you're just an incredibly experienced expert, you get behind the scenes day in and day out. What is your opinion of the current state of commercial real estate in the United States and then specific to New York as well? Right. Well, Jeanette, I can talk uh, about New York. Uh, that's where I spend all of my time. I only uh, very peripherally know what's going on around the country. So I can talk about New York and then maybe extrapolate a little to, to what we're seeing. But, um, you know, the New York market is very, very interesting. I think this correction that we're in now is the second correction, um, which followed very closely after the last correction. Uh, and just to go to 40,000 feet, I think the the investment sales market, the, the bull market ended in October of 2015, from October of 15 through February of 20. Um, we had a 56% drop in the number in the dollar volume of sales, 54% drop in the number of properties sold. Um, and if you, and over that time values dropped by about 12% on average, uh, then COVID came along, converted what was mostly a volume correction into a value correction. Um, and we started to come out of that trough, uh, in the beginning of the second quarter of 2001, actually second half of 2001, first half of 2002, it was actually a really great 12 months. I thought we were coming out of it and, by all estimations, you would have to think that was happening because that was the longest correction we've ever had, even surpassing the SNL crisis in the early 90s. Um, but then the Fed starts raising interest rates in March. 
of 22 by August, September starts to really exert downward pressure on values. We go into another correction. So now, you know, for a while I was wondering whether it was one long correction that started in October of 15, but actually I think it's two separate corrections uh, precipitated by two different things. Um, and so now we, we are in this market where, um, you know, we have a lot of challenges that people are facing, mortgages that are maturing today, generally have rates in, in the threes. Uh, and if you're refinancing today, uh, you're going to be getting less proceeds and you're going to be paying about double what you were paying before. So that's creating a lot of challenges for people. I think one of the interesting things about the market today is that different product sectors are performing differently. Um, I would argue that today in New York City, the retail sector is actually on the upswing uh, because it started to get negatively impacted way before anything else did. And so we've seen retail rents um, generally considered to have bottomed out. Leasing activity is picking up. Investor demand is back and has been <clears throat> has been for several months now. So retail is doing great. Um, I think that the multifamily sector has significant political headwinds, but very, very robust demand. Um, and we've seen the land market um, picking up in areas where we have uh, good dynamics, where the condo market seems to be doing pretty well. So that market is good. The land market for rental land is non-existent because there's no tax abatement today. Hotel land is starting to pick up because the hotel sector is doing relatively well out of 120. 20,000 hotel rooms, 30,000 are no longer hotel rooms, 14,000 were converted to student housing and other uses, 16,000 are housing migrants. So the dynamics in hotels are really good. And then of course, everybody's talking about office and that's where the biggest challenges are. Uh, clearly there you have to differentiate between class A new construction office, which seems to be holding holding its own, doing pretty well. B and C office is really taking it its lumps. Um, just within the past couple of weeks, there was a deal announced downtown uh, at under two hundred dollars a square foot. Uh, there's a building on West Thirty Ninth Street recently sold for two hundred and twenty dollars a foot. I mean, these are prices that we saw twenty five years ago. So it's uh, it's really interesting to see what's happening. So. One of the, the really interesting things about the market is that we have a number of clients today that uh, are handing keys back to their lenders uh, because the buildings just don't make sense to hold on to anymore. But at the same time, they're raising hundreds of millions of dollars, if not billions of dollars, to go out and buy new properties. So uh, very, very interesting yin and yang going on in the market at the present time. You know, you're touching on several different interesting factors that I want to dig into. So, you know, first and foremost, it's interesting what you're talking about, because I've actually heard of groups intentionally giving the keys back to the lender, raising the capital and then turning around and actually buying it back directly from the lender at a fraction of the price and then just executing basically the same business plan that they had originally intended to do. Definitely a risk. I would not want to be on that investor phone call, you know, trying to pitch uh, that idea to people. But I have heard of it happening. Um, it's interesting. Now, I'm curious too, given all of these dynamics, how are people making deals work? How are you helping people pencil deals or structure deals in a way that can make sense, particularly given the pressure that we're facing from such a high inflationary you know, environment with the interest rates to compound that on top of it? Yeah, you well, know, Jeanette, the, the interesting thing about my practice is that I represented the seller exclusively in, in all my transactions. So how to how to make them pencil, um, you know, that's that's the buyer's uh, dilemma to figure out. But what I can tell you is that I really believe this is the best buying opportunity that I, I I've ever, ever seen. I have always said that the SNL crisis was the best buying opportunity. It was a great buying opportunity. Anybody that had the capital and the courage to buy in 1990, 1991, 1992, even 93, they did fantastically well. I think that based on what's going on today, um, there are significant political uncertainties in the market today. Public policy has never been more highly correlated to the way the markets function. Uh, we have a lot of folks here who, for instance, don't think residential real estate should be a for-profit business. Uh, so we have so many things going on today, uh, in addition to the interest rate environment, uh, the refinancing risk, 
um, the the folks that still have not come back from working at home. Uh, so many things that are negatively impacting the market that I really believe today is the best buying opportunity I've, I've ever seen. Uh, when you have properties that will trade on a price per square foot basis, where they were trading at 20 or 25 years ago. If you are a believer in the future of New York, and I, I think that that uh, for some folks may be more and more challenging than ever, but if you're a believer in New York long-term, you have to be buying property today. Interesting. So given that you're working from the seller side of the house as opposed to the buyers, what type of concessions are sellers having to give or, you know, kind of terms are they having to swallow or agree to what's and, and what's motivating, you know, a lot of these sales, is it just the pressure? Is it that the business plans just don't make sense anymore? Is it that they can't write it any longer? What are the main factors that are driving anyone to actually sell on the market right now? There are a number of factors that are uh, inducing and motivating sellers to make a move today. And, um, you know, what I, I will say that uh, every time I, I have a meeting with a potential seller, I start the meeting by selling by saying, if you don't have to sell and or you don't have a very, very compelling strategic reason to sell, don't even think about it right now. Um, the fact is, values are low. We are at or near the bottom of where this market is going to uh, going to be. Uh, and I strongly suggest to people they don't sell if they don't have to or there's not a compelling reason to. That being said, we always have the old reliable uh, death, divorce, taxes, partnership disputes uh, that uh, induce folks to sell. And then there are other reasons that are are strategically compelling. Um, you know, you used to get checks from a building every month and today. Uh, those checks have either gotten very, very small, or you may actually have to be feeding that building. Some people don't want to do that um, indefinitely. There are some folks who are saying, you know what, now is the opportunity. I'm going to sell really low, but I want to move up in class. I'm going to buy a better quality building, and I'm going to buy that really low because that because that's low too. Mm -hmm. Or folks are saying, now is the time, you know, I should have done it years ago, but I, I need to geographically diversify it. I have to sell a few assets in New York City and go buy in Florida or Texas or Tennessee or North Carolina or South Carolina, where folks seem to be doing extraordinarily well. Population's growing. Economic development is very stimulating. Uh, and, you know, those are the kinds of decisions that are are making people sell. And then also... Uh, age has been a factor, believe it or not. Uh, I have a number of clients who have basically said, look, I, I could wait uh, four or five years to sell, but by that time, maybe I'm not going to enjoy the money as much as I would if I could sell today. So, uh, you know, there are a number of factors that come into play when people uh, decide that they need to make a move, but um, its conditions are not optimal to sell today. Yeah, very true. I, I, I can definitely appreciate that, at least from the multi-family standpoint. Um, now, I don't like to get into politics, so let me be very clear with all the listeners. I'm not getting political, but I have to ask. So what do you think potentially could be the implications in what has been ruled against Trump for the New York real estate market? Okay, and I will tell you that I talk about policy all the time. Um, mainly because it, it is so highly correlated to the way markets function that you have to look at policy. Sure. Um, and I'll tell you that I also, I do not look at uh, policy as a Democrat or as a Republican. I look at it as a real estatearian. So I will tell you that I'll, I'll give you the perspective from uh, real estate. And, you know, I think that it is, um, it is scaring the hell out of a lot of people uh, what's going on, because, uh, for instance, I do a lot of um, of land arbitration work. Uh, I've done a lot of land sales in my career. I understand and know the land sale market uh, here extraordinarily well. Uh, so I am called in as an expert to testify on land value. And I'll tell you, I'm working on a, a case I just finished working on a case where we had two appraisers that were both 
decades of experience, two of the top people in the industry. No one could say a single bad thing about these folks or their track record or their experience or what they've done. One appraiser came in at 310 million for this piece of land. One came in at 555 million for the piece of land. Oh, wow. So it both had very, very strong substantiation for why they thought the value was what it was. But what if you were an owner who who got the $555 million appraisal and then used that to go get a loan, got the loan, paid it back, uh, no one uh, was hurt by it, and then somebody decided they didn't like you and they were going to get you, and all of a sudden, you know, they're trying to wipe you out financially. That is extraordinarily scary. That That has nothing to do with, you know, do do people and this is not an indictment of of real estate people but if you're getting a an appraisal for estate tax purposes as the person getting that appraisal you'd like that appraisal to be low uh if you are trying to use an appraisal to get financing or use the building as collateral for some other reason you want that appraisal to be high there is no empirical formula that says it's like in math, you know, one plus one equals two. Nobody can argue with that. If you say it's four, you're wrong. Uh, in, a, in appraising property, there is no right answer. There is a, a, an educated opinion based on using a collection of facts. And unless you went through a very comprehensive marketing program and got a, a tremendous number of bids and you expose that property to the widest audience of potential buyers, had a, a very transparent process, went through a negotiating process and then eked out the highest price, you could say, yes, that's market value. But if you're just thinking about it from a theoretical point of view, this is highly, highly uh, subjective. So in the example I used where you were, you know, in the low 300s and the mid 500s, that's a massive gap. So mm -hmm. you tell me if you happen to be someone who's not in favor with with um, as someone who's in a, a position of authority, your whole career could be at jeopardy in jeopardy. I, I think it is uh, it is unbelievable that something like that was allowed to happen. And it's not a. Uh, again, a comment on who's involved or who's not involved or what's going on. But I mean, this happens every day. If you really wanted to dig into every single person that owns real estate in the whole country, you could probably dr extrapolate that set of circumstances to every single owner in the United States. Yeah, absolutely. I don't disagree. <clears throat> it makes me think of you know, whether we're talking single family or multifamily, like a broker opinion of value or anything else like that, it is all very subjective. It even makes me think of, frankly, the process for which autoimmune diseases are diagnosed, because it's almost the same thing. They just take a combination of factors and bada bing, bada boom, call it something, you know. Um, so what do you think the, the potential solutions are for something like this? Do we need better regulation around this, more of a defined process? You know, where would you even begin to think that we could somehow bring some type of consistency across the board? Ready to Scale is brought to you by Blue Lake Capital, where we hunt down the best multifamily investment opportunities that we can find and invite investors to join in with us. We target Class B value-add multifamily properties across the Sun Belt. Our CEO, Ellie Perlman, invests a substantial amount of capital into every deal. This means our interests are aligned with yours. If you're an accredited investor looking to expand your portfolio and diversify sponsors, be sure to visit us at bluelake-capital.com. Blue Lake Capital, be bold, be extraordinary, and keep moving forward. I, I don't know that you can. I don't know that you can. And I know there was uh, there was a guy in New York about 10 years ago, a Wall Street guy who got into the real estate industry and wanted to try to create indexes so that both tenants and owners could hedge um, the market, hedge whether rents were going to go up or rents were going to go down. And I, I knew right away, I said, there's no way you could do that for a couple of reasons. One, uh, you have massive, massive landlords that could manipulate the market by raising their asking rents, lowering their asking rents. They literally could arbitrage and 
and manipulate the market. And secondly, a square foot of office space in owner A's portfolio is actually a different size than a square foot of office space in owner B's portfolio because they apply different different uh, loss factors to different buildings. You know, you, you look at certain buildings. I know one very famous building here in New York, when it was built in the 1960s, it was touted as 865,000 square feet. Um, then uh, when it sold maybe 20 years ago, it was 1.1 million feet. Today, that building I think is 1.3 million feet. So maybe because of all the rain that's rained on it over the decades, it's grown, but there are different ways of counting footage. So, uh, you know, real estate is not, um, it, it's not a bunch of widgets. Every building's different. Every square foot is different. And I don't know how you could create a, a situation where you standardize the appraisal practice such that um, you you standardize um, adjustments. Like you look at you look at location A and location B, and in your opinion, you might say, "Hey, location A, twenty five percent better than location B." I might say, "Hey, I think location B is three and a half percent better than location." Well, where do you come up with these numbers? <laughs> what you know, the, 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 it's not empirical. It's not empirical. It's an opinion. So how, when you, and particularly when you're relying on someone who is, is certified to give this opinion, and even people with all the credentials and all the track record and all the accolades uh, have a difference of opinion, to, uh, to have someone uh, suffer monetary damages because they relied on the expert, that, that's pretty harsh. Yeah, yeah, it is. Uh, that's a that's a fair assessment of the situation, and it's actually more interesting to me to hear it coming from you, being a New Yorker, uh, where the impact is very much felt in your own backyard potentially, and and I can understand people's concerns around it. Um, so it, it is helpful to actually see it from all angles. Uh, so thank yeah, you. Look, for I will tell you the biggest the biggest impact that politics has had on the New York market was started really in 2018. Uh, when a lot of the policymakers started talking about changes that ultimately were implemented in the multifamily market in June of 2019, where they essentially removed the ability to extract upside potential from properties. And this is one of the big um, uh, issues and problems uh, with our, our housing policy here, is that it's so clear, so evident, that the solution to all of New York's housing problems are on the supply side, right? We had, and and what the what the policymakers do, and I've had this conversation with the governor, I've had this conversation with the mayor. You have to increase supply; it solves all the problems. But what our policymakers do is they try to confiscate private property, limit what you can do with it, tell you who you can rent to, how much rent you can charge, and those those constraints on the market actually are, are, are more deleterious than anything. And so what we have is a situation where um, every policymaker says, hey, we want New York to be more affordable for everybody, but yet every single piece of legislation that's passed or been ignored since 2018 has done nothing but constricted supply and exerted upward pressure on rents, making it less affordable for everybody. So if anybody listening is a New York resident is a free market tenant and you think you're paying too much in rent, it's your local politician's fault. Look no further than, than the pandemic when a lot of people moved out of New York, uh, vacancy rose, vacancy rising is like supply increasing and rents dropped by 30%, 30% in one year. Do you know there's not been a housing policy implemented anywhere in the United States that has come close to that? All we have to do is increase supply. It's it's such a no-brainer, and yet we can't get the political will to make that happen. Solid point. I can definitely attest to the fact that as a multifamily owner and operator, we have zero interest in doing business in the New York markets uh, for exactly those reasons. Last time you were on the show, we were actually talking about the 
the increase to tenants' bill of rights and you know things along those lines. And I wasn't actually going to get into it in this episode, but I do have to say that you know I just recently moved to California and I am just frankly shocked at the extent of squatting that exists out here and how long it can take for people to actually remove squatters. Rather, we're talking about you know residential properties, or I imagine it probably is applicable to commercial uh, properties as well. Rather, it's retail or maybe office space that's you know simply vacant. Um, you know, and I know that it's also become an increasing issue as well. So just out of curiosity, since we're kind of dipping our toe into the waters, you know, what is going on with what almost appears to be a squatting crisis at this point in markets like California and New York? Yeah, I, I think it clearly is an issue. Um, I know there are limitations on how long someone has to be there uh, before they can claim rights. So I think it's important on folks you know, important that folks who own properties that they're not actively living in to check in on them uh, regularly to see what's going on. But, you know, I think a lot of the policy that has evolved uh, is really the fault of, of every citizen, uh, because in New York, our biggest problem actually is voter apathy. Uh, less than 15 percent of registered voters actually vote in our elections. So um, we elect folks that that make these policies. And if you want change, the only way to effectuate that change is to become politically active, become aware of the issues, um, make sure that um, that you are um, you're encouraging your family members to vote. You're encouraging your your coworkers who live in the city to vote. Um, and that that's really the only way to effectuate change. Yeah, uh, very good point. Very good point. You know, I'm thinking more, <clears throat> excuse me, I'm thinking more about your comment about the fact that rents were able to be decreased by up to 30% because, you know, uh, essentially supply was increased by having such strong net migration out of the area and into other markets. And it's interesting because, especially from the multifamily side of the house, since we're very much talking about affordable housing, granted, we don't play with um, the affordable focus, the affordable, you know, we're, we're not in that space. We're not looking at affordable housing but we are doing multifamily. And the reality is, is that in a free market, it has its own checks and balances and, the own, and corrections that come into play. So, you know, it's been interesting for us because across, you know, essentially the Sun Belt, there's been a large uptick in supply coming into the markets. And that of course has naturally softened rents across the markets. And which is reasonable because, you know, during the time, if we look back, say during COVID, I mean, rents were raising like crazy across, you know, the entire Sun Belt market. And, you know, and it wasn't sustainable. It simply wasn't. And so I think the ebb and flow, you know, is very important overall to the health and well-being of the market as a whole. And when it comes to New York, if you don't have any type of policies in place that are going to motivate additional development, no one's going to come. No one's going to want to. It just doesn't make sense. And they'll actually take the business elsewhere. So, you know, I think it's good that that you're really bringing attention to this dynamic because I think it is something that unless people are pretty heavily involved in real estate, they may not realize is is fundamental to being able to address the need for affordable housing. The reality is, yeah, is that yeah, market will yeah, do Jeanette, what you what you're talking about uh, across the country is the market forces working and mm -hmm. doing what they do. Um, you know, as in terms of rent control and price fixing, um, you know, the Wharton School and MIT both have done studies. Uh, that demonstrated that in the absence of any rent regulation in New York, average rents would be lower. Mm -hmm. um, but yet a lot of it has to do with uh, who are the more active and vocal voters, uh, who's going to keep uh, policymakers in, in office. Um, and um, that sometimes is very, very uh, divorced from uh, economic realities. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, uh, Bob, I could go on for a long time on this one, but I do want to make sure that I pick your brain about one more other item before we wrap up. So, you know, um, there is a lot, a lot of commercial real estate loans that are going to be coming due towards, you know, <clears throat> the end of this year, well into next year. And I just can't imagine the the scenario of, you know, everyone turning over keys, lenders don't want to own these properties, you know, they're not, you know, owner and operators, you know, <clears throat> so it seems very far fetched to me that ultimately this is how it's going to play out. So I'm curious, specifically from your standpoint as a broker, 
where do you see the opportunities that are going to be created by this? Do you really think that we're going to have tons of keys turned over to lenders? Do you think that that is exactly where the opportunity lies, that brokers will will be kind of that that step right in between, you know, uh, basically a, a seller turning keys over to a bank as opposed to selling? You know, what are what are your insights here? Yeah, well, it's loosening up a little bit, but I'll say that one of the big differences between this correction and corrections in the past uh, has been that lenders lender behavior has been very, very different. Um, you know, SNL crisis. Banks went through two or three year foreclosure process, took title, hired brokers, sold the assets. Um, in the uh, recession, in the early 2000s and the GFC, banks didn't want to go through that long process. They hired brokers to sell the paper. Uh, this time around, they've been playing things much closer to the vest, uh, I think, because a lot of them are aware that they there are a lot of issues on their balance sheets, but they don't necessarily want everybody to know that. So. A lot of the transactions that we've heard, the principals have said, hey, you know, the the bank where I keep my deposits called me up and said, hey, you want to buy this one at a discount? And, you know, they're trying to make deals a little on the QT, although I will say more and more opportunities are coming to brokers now, but still only a fraction of what that level of activity has been in the past. Um, but, you know, we'll see. We'll see how that plays out, but it is absolutely an issue because what do you do when, you know, you have a $50 million mortgage, it's at three and a half percent, your mortgage is maturing, the bank says, yeah, sure, I'll refinance you, I'll give you 35 million. Um, and it's going to be at at 7% or seven and a half percent. What do you do? Uh, if you don't have the 15 million to do the refi, then the writing's on the wall. But if you do have the 15 million, what what a lot of my clients are struggling with today is, hey, do I put that fresh 15 million into this asset or do I put that into a new asset? Uh, and that's a, that's a very difficult and challenging decision for a lot of folks. Yeah, yeah, it definitely is. You know, I was surprised as well to hear you mention that you feel like class A is actually uh, performing and doing better than class B and C. I would actually, again, being, I, I'm just focused on multifamily, so I never pay attention to the office sector. Um, but, you know, I'm curious and, and I'm surprised to hear that actually, because it seems to me like B and C might likely be doing better simply for the fact that we happen in a, you know, a, a, in an inflationary environment and people are always looking for deals and class B and C seem like they would be the more affordable options. So I'm surprised where, what am I missing here? Yeah, Jeanette, they absolutely, it is, there are more affordable option, but we have a hundred million feet of office space, either empty or soon to be empty in New York. There are only six cities in the whole country that have a hundred million feet. So we've got a lot of empty space. And the fact is that, that folks really are demanding new. If you look at new condo buildings uh, on the Upper East Side, for instance, um, anything west of Third Avenue, uh, about three quarters of those new condominium properties uh, are being purchased by folks coming out of older co-op buildings. Mm. They're they're New Yorkers. They want to stay here, but they want new. They want fresh. They want new amenities. They want systems that work properly or that are updated. Um, you know, they want to be able to renovate any time of year rather than in a two week window in August. Um, they want new in the same way in the office sector. If you go into one of the new office buildings that's been been that's come online within the past couple of years, being in those buildings is a completely different experience than being in an older building. Because no matter how much money you put into an older building, there are certain things you can't do. You really can't change ceiling heights. You can't take columns out. Um, you know, floor to ceiling glass, high ceilings, no columns. I mean, you feel like you're in a whole different world. Um, so, um, you know, I, I, it, it's almost like being in a high school gym versus being in Madison square garden. It is a completely, completely different feel. Um, and so I think the, um, uh, yes, there will always be a, a low cost provider and there'll be a demand for low cost space. Uh, but we have a ton of that. Um, and I think that the, uh, the, the demand for new, and the um, the allure that new has uh, is continuing to attract tenants, and uh, I think will continue to do so. Very interesting. Maybe some uh, residual effects of being 
working from home, being cooped up throughout COVID, compromising on, you know, quality of life issues along the way. Uh, very insightful, uh, interesting to me. All right. Well, Bob, as always, this was totally fun. I love speaking to you. You have uh, so much insight. Uh, definitely we'll have to have you back on again. And uh, fingers crossed in case there's a big announcement that might be coming out in your world soon. Uh, in the meantime, before we let you go, last time we did this, so you're going to have to think of extra creative answers. So uh, what are one of your hobbies? Okay, I uh, I collect game-used Marc Messier hockey memorabilia, jerseys, <laughs> gloves, sticks, the skates, and I've been doing that for almost 30 years and uh, absolutely love it. Hey, that's fun. You did not say that last time. Okay, good. All right. And then one of the other questions I asked you last time is something fun that people don't know about you. Something fun people don't know about me. Um, well, let's see. I uh, I absolutely love to cook and I grill all the time, especially when I'm up at the country house. One of my favorite things to do uh, is pour a glass of wine, get in front of the grill and cook away. And uh, that's a very, very enjoyable pastime. Nice, nice. If you have any recipes to share, we'll be sure to include one in the uh, the show notes. You know, it could be, you know, Bob Knackle 2.0. We can get you a, a grilling show going on. There you go. <laughs> All right. What about as far as a book? Is there any particular book that you think people should read, particularly with where we are right now, uh, kind of, you know, in the market, in the economy? It, it's such an interesting place for real estate right now. Yeah, well, I, you know what? I have there's so many great books. I actually have a reading list that I send to people. So if anyone uh, would uh, like, uh, my reading list. Um, you know, right now my email address is uh, Bob Knackle at knacklemaproom.com. Uh, email me. I'm happy to send you the list, but I have to tell you, I absolutely love the series of books by uh, Dr. Benjamin Hardy and Dan Sullivan. Uh, 10X is easier than 2X, The Gap and the Gain and Who Not How. Fantastic books. Read them. They'll change your life. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's all about achieving, um, optimal results. Um, and, uh, those books have so many great, great things to do, uh, to make you as productive as you possibly can be. Excellent recommendation. All right. Well, you already took my last question, which was how people can get in contact with you. So I have one other that I'll slide in. So, you know, one of the goals that we talk about on the show is, yes, we love real estate. Yes, we love money. We like returns. You know, we like to know that, you know, we're we're building wealth and, you know, that's all well and good. But the whole point, of course, is what it allows us to do with our lives. And ideally, we want to be able to live extraordinary lives you know, that align well with our passions and values and things along those lines. So what's your advice for someone that is really dedicated to building and living an extraordinary life? Well, you know, I think, so you're, you're, um, I guess, lean, leading towards work-life balance. Uh, and that I think is probably one of the most challenging things for everyone. And there's no correct answer because that work-life balance is different for everyone. Um, I'll say that when you're starting out in your career, probably for your first seven to 10 years, you have no work-life balance. If you want to really excel in, in your career, it's all about your career. But when you eventually do well and you want to have that work-life balance, one of the interesting exercises uh, that I think folks should do, and I've done this a couple of times in my life, uh, but you pretend that, uh, that you passed away. And you want five people in your life to eulogize you at your funeral, a uh, family member, a friend, a coworker, someone from your church or synagogue, um, and someone who may know you peripherally. Um, but have those folks write the eulogies that you want those five people to say at your funeral. And that actually is a blueprint for the way that you want to live your life. Uh, and it's a very, very introspective exercise uh, if you sit and, and you really take the time to do it. Um, it really can change the, your behavior, uh, the way you do certain things, the way you allocate your time. Uh, and I think it's a great exercise to do. And um, you'll learn something about yourself if you do that. 
Excellent advice. I remember you shared this last time and it can't be said too many times at all. So great advice. Thank you, Bob. All right. Well, thank you so much for coming on the show. Really have enjoyed having you. For those of you that have tuned in with us today, I'm sure you have also enjoyed hearing from Bob. Feel free to reach out to him with the contact information that we'll include in the show notes. And in the meantime, be bold, be strong, and keep moving forward.